Hello and welcome. This is Advanced Storm Spotting for First Responders. I'm Jenny Laughlin with the National Weather Service in Pleasant Hill. Now this course doesn't have any prerequisites like the title might suggest. Uh, what we'll do is simply go a little more into depth into feature recognition and storm spotting, just for those that may be out supporting events, uh, responding to calls, or perhaps spotting for their departments during hazardous weather. This will be the general format of the talk. We'll start out with a 10 to 15 minute basics review. This will be what you would see in a traditional spotter talk, and then we'll go a little more in depth after that. Next, we'll go into radar interpretation. We're not expecting you to be able to tell us if a storm is severe or not uh, just by looking at it on radar. But what we do want you to be able to do is just use radar as another tool uh, if you're out in the field, just for recognizing maybe where a storm is located, how far it might be from your location, and then some different shapes and signatures that may give you a hint of what type of storm you might be looking at and how quickly it may be moving towards your location. We'll spend the bulk of the time on feature recognition. This is looking at images of shelf clouds, wall clouds, supercells, and learning how to recognize these if you do see them out in the field. After that, we'll go into safety, and then we'll wrap it up with some reporting and weather resources. To get started, we'll begin by reviewing the severe weather hazards that you may encounter. Straight line winds are one of the most common hazards that we have in this area. Anything above about 58 miles an hour is considered severe, and while that seems like kind of an arbitrary number, that's where we start to see some tree damage, uh, limbs down, possibly some branches breaking. And while trees like Bradford pears and maybe some trees that are damaged or have dry rot may start to break before this, it's usually when you start to see some damage to those hardwoods. Once you get above about 70 miles an hour, you can actually start to see some structural damage just from straight line winds. And once you get up to about 100 miles an hour, which is usually the higher end of what straight line wind can be, you start to see some major structural damage. Uh, we've seen garages damaged, they're destroyed, uh, outbuildings destroyed, that sort of thing. So straight line wind damage, while it should be less than what you would see with a tornado, it can actually be over a larger area and maybe more widespread. Very strong winds can actually push or tip vehicles, especially if that road surface is wet or if it's elevated. So if you do feel that happening, just try to move to lower ground or move onto a drier surface where you may get some better traction. Uh-oh. Yep, he just made a mistake. There he goes. A stuck one now. Flash flooding is also very common in this area. Anything that's six inches or deep, uh, whether it's flowing or standing water, is considered flash flooding, and obviously it can get quite a bit deeper than that. If you are seeing damage, most of the time that's a result of flowing water. That's what could cause bridges to wash out, uh, structural damage underneath those road surfaces, and can make flooding very dangerous. Typically, areas of terrain and urban areas are where you're going to see the highest threat of flash flooding. The terrain isn't an issue for us, but once you get into those urban areas, like within the city where there's a lot more pavement, you're really not seeing grounds that are capable of absorbing that rainfall, and so some lesser rainfall rates can actually cause flash flooding. Uh, more so than they would in more rural areas. Flash flooding is the biggest severe weather-related killer. That's over a 30-year average. 
uh, within the last 11 years, both Joplin and Katrina have kind of thrown off that statistic and moved flash flooding into third. Uh, but over a longer period of time, this is usually the biggest threat to public safety, and this is where you may see a few more fatalities. I'm not leaving it something. Big. Hey, that'll kill you. That hit you. Because it's going to hit him in the head and probably get hurt him if he gets hit. Hey, there's a deer. is pretty common with severe weather in this area. Now anything with a diameter greater than an inch or about the size of a quarter is considered severe. It does take about inch and a half to maybe golf ball size to start seeing dents in cars and broken glass, uh, vehicle damage like that. However, windblown hail that's a little bit smaller, even pea-sized hail if it's associated with really strong winds, uh, can cause some significant damage as well. Once you get into those larger sizes like you saw in that video, hail actually tends to fall in isolation. You may not see rain or even other hail sizes around it, uh, just a couple of thunks of that really big hail. So if you are driving into something, it could be the first hailstone you see is, is a pretty large one. So if you do see that, go ahead and turn around. Uh, if you continue driving, you're probably going to drive into more hail, and even if it does get smaller, it may get more numerous, uh, it could become windblown, that kind of thing. So better to just turn around and get back out of that hail core, move back under the base or outside of the storm, uh, wherever your location was before. The record hailstone is 8 inches in diameter that fell in Vivian, South Dakota a couple of years ago. And that was actually after a little bit of melting. Uh, the hailstone did fall through his roof, landed in the living room, and of course then he picked it up, took pictures with it, put it in the freezer, took it back out, showed it to his neighbors. Um, so by the time the survey crew got there and measured that 8 inch measurement, uh, there was actually some significant melting that had occurred. And when the survey team went out, they also looked out in the yard and measured some divots and saw some that were up to 11 inches wide. So Hail does have the potential to get pretty big, and when it does, definitely poses a threat to uh, life and property. We've all seen tornadoes. Fortunately, the vast majority of tornadoes are on that weaker end, EF0 to EF1. However, tornadoes do have to hit something in order to be rated. Um, it is a damage scale. So there may be some that are lumped into that category that weren't necessarily that weak. Uh, but a lot of those tornadoes are going to be on that weaker end, about 110 miles an hour or less. Once you get to the EF2, EF3 scale, that's when you're looking at a little bit more moderate damage, looking at wind speeds around 110 to maybe even 160 miles an hour. Those can still come from non-supercells, uh, so a storm that you may not actually expect to be producing a tornado. Uh, sometimes you can see a spin up. Usually it's short-lived, uh, but can actually produce some moderate damage. The strongest tornadoes do tend to be longer lived, um, and they are produced from supercells, which makes them just a little bit easier to forecast and detect. Uh, they are going to be longer lived, so there's a better chance that they probably will be observed at some point in their life cycle and reported to us so that we can incorporate that information into the tornado warning. Unfortunately, these tornadoes occur about 1% of the time or less, so 1% of all of your tornadoes are going to be in that EF4 to EF5 range. There are a lot of different storm types. We're only going to focus on two here. Uh, the first would be a squall line, sometimes called a QLCS, but we'll call it a squall line here. And that's just a conglomeration of storms that's all moving out in one direction. Because of that, the main threat with them tends to be straight line winds. Uh, you get all of that precipitation coming down, pushing out in the same direction, and so it kicks out a really strong outflow and creates some strong winds. You can see tornadoes with these. Uh, last year we had a couple of different examples of where there were squall lines that were pushing outward a little segment of it spun up and created a tornado. Um, so that does happen, but the main threat with these is going to be those straight line winds. Supercells will have the entire gamut of severe weather. Uh, you could see large hail, straight line winds, flash flooding, and tornadoes. So that's why it's really important to be able to recognize these when you're out in the field 
Uh, you could be dealing with some pretty significant severe weather, and the majority of the severe weather that you are going to get is probably going to come from this storm type. Situational awareness is just how you become aware of what type of weather is expected later in the day or within the next couple of days. And one really good way to get situational awareness is through this situation report that we put out every day. This product is updated three times a day, uh, once at 5 a.m., then between 11 and 1 p.m., and again during the mid-afternoon. And it'll usually look like this, starts out with a title at the top, uh, some sort of graphic that should show you kind of the areas where significant weather might be expected. And then we'll have this spotter activation that you can see there that's for the public, and we can't actually activate spotters. We can't tell people to go out. Uh, but it is a little bit of a heads up for them if we are going to need reports later. So something that you could use as well to be able to tell if we think the storms are going to be significant enough that we may need reports later. Underneath that, you can see the highlight section. That's where we can put a little bit more information. Um, so what type of hazards are we expecting, timing, and uh, more specificity to the area. This can be up to about four pages long. If we have a lot of information to include, like this flash flood watch, uh, we may extend it out a little bit. On a quieter weather day, it's probably just going to be one page. This is available on our website every day, uh, but we'll also email it out when significant severe weather is expected. So multiple ways that you can find this, and definitely a good tool to get and maintain your situational awareness when significant weather is expected. Since we showed those graphics in the previous page, these are the different categories that we'll put in those thunderstorm outlooks that you saw. And the words aren't super important here. What is important is just kind of the colors. Um, so as you get into those brighter colors, those warmer colors, that's where you're starting to see both a higher probability of severe weather and some more significant weather that is expected. So larger hail sizes, stronger tornadoes, stronger winds. When we have severe weather in this area, we're usually sitting in that green to yellow area. So, you know, we are expecting severe weather, but hopefully just a few storms um, and maybe on the lower end of that severe weather threat. Once you get into the oranges and reds, then we're expecting a lot more significant severe weather. And if you get into that pink, that's a high risk. Um, these are really rare, and usually the only reason it's going to be issued for our area would be for a tornado outbreak. The only reasons that it can be issued is for a tornado outbreak or a wind outbreak, which you can see they call it a ratio here. Uh, but usually those will be in the eastern U.S. If you do see one here, uh, probably going to be associated with a tornado outbreak. And the last one we've had, even close to the area, was April 14th, 2012. Um, so fortunately pretty rare. If you do see one, it does mean there's probably going to be something very significant later in the day. This is our situational awareness cone, and it just shows you based on how far out that severe weather is, what you may want to do to prepare. So we start out in this outlook phase. That's when you want to start becoming situationally aware. You want to start checking your action plan, checking that situational report that we just showed, um, and looking at some of the severe outlooks. As far as preparing at work, this may be when you need to start adjusting staffing, uh, maybe prepare ahead if you're going to be sending out some spotters. And usually in that one to three day range, we can start to anticipate severe weather. It doesn't always happen that way, but usually there's some indication that we'll have some strong storms uh, about one to three days out. So it gives you a little bit of a chance to prepare. Once you get into that watch stage, that's a few hours out. Um, that's when you need to start checking forecast updates, monitoring conditions, making sure if you're at home um, and your kids are at school and they normally walk home, who's going to pick them up, uh, that type of preparation. And if you are at work, maybe it's time to start staffing up, figuring out who's going to be heading out spotting, and maybe even starting to head out into the field to position if you are going to be mobile spotting. At this point, this is when you'll usually see a watch go out. You could see a mesoscale discussion. Uh, those will pop into NWS chats. You may have seen those before, which will tell you that a watch is either coming soon or maybe isn't coming soon. Uh, but that'll be within this same time frame, this hours long time frame. Once you get into that warning stage, it's a few minutes before severe weather is expected. This is when you would see the issuance of those tornado warnings for thunderstorm warnings. And this is when you only have a few minutes to act. So if you're at home, it's time to take shelter. If you're out in the field, it gives you a focus for uh, where you should be headed, where you should be spotting, and also lets you know what those specific hazards might be. And we'll go into a little more detail on both those watches and warnings in a second. There's also a time frame that we don't talk about in here, which is kind of in between that watch and warning time frame. And that's something that we're really working with right now to figure out if there is a way that we can give uh, outdoor events, um, particularly vulnerable populations like people in mobile homes, maybe hospitals if they need to start moving people, 
Those groups are going to need more than just a couple of minutes, uh, but they may not want to start acting right during that watch stage, especially if it's issued, you know, at 11 o'clock in the morning and storms aren't expected until 5 o'clock. So between that watch and warning stage is really where we're starting to work to see if there's additional information that we can provide uh, to our partners so they can pass that information along. So this is what a watch would look like. This is an example of a spirit thunderstorm watch, uh, but tornado watches are also going to look similar. And it just means that atmospheric conditions are supportive of hazardous weather. So it doesn't necessarily mean that storms have developed yet. You may see a few that have started to bubble up by the time this watch goes out. We try to get it out before anything is severe. So this means you need to prepare to take action. It doesn't mean you need to take action now, uh, but it does mean that you need to be closely monitoring the weather and making sure that you have a way of receiving warnings if any are issued because severe weather is possible within the next couple of hours. And a warning means that severe weather is imminent or occurring. It means that either we've detected something on radar that tells us that storm might be severe or we've received a report of severe weather um, and we've gone ahead and issued a warning because of that. This means it's time to take shelter, that storm is within a few minutes away and is going to impact your location. And if you are out spotting, it will give you an idea where you need to head and probably where you should be focusing as a spotter. We won't spend too much time on radar, we're just going to go through some of the basics here. And this graphic just shows you how the radar is scanning outwards, it runs into something and it returns a signal back to it. And that's how we get information about storms that are surrounding our area. So this is the base product that you're going to look at. It's called reflectivity. This is what you would see on TV, um, on the web, or maybe on an app that you have on your phone. And really all it's telling you is how much of that outgoing signal, how much of it is returning back based on what it just ran into. So it's going to tell you how reflective that thing is that it just ran into. The amount of reflectivity will depend on both the size of what it just ran into and the type of target that it just ran into. So Rain and hail is going to be super reflective. It's going to return a really strong signal back to the radar. And so where you see those reds and pinks, that's probably some rain and hail. Once you get into the lighter colors, probably some lighter precipitation. And then when you get into that light blue, um, and then you can see the matte background behind that, that's where you're probably not seeing any precipitation. So you can get an idea if you're outside of that storm, maybe where is it relative to your location. If you loop it a little bit, you can see where it's moving. Um, just gives you an idea, hey, this storm is near me. This is its general shape and this is where it's heading. Velocity is another tool that we can look at. And when the radar scans outward, it actually sends a couple of different pulses. And so it can check that thing that I just ran into, did it move? Um, it's only able to tell if it moved towards or away from the radar. So you're not gonna get a completely accurate estimate of how fast that thing might be moving. Pretty similar to like a police radar gun where they're only gonna get a really accurate reading if it's moving directly towards or away from um, that radar. So same idea there, but it can be a really useful tool for determining rotation. Um, and you can see that in this example, if you have an object that's rotating, it should be moving the same speed in all directions. So the radar is going to pick up that rotation in two different spots. So you can see here, if we flip back and forth between the reflectivity and the velocity a couple of different times, it really helps you zero in on what part of that storm should I be worried about? Um, if there is a tornado warning on it, where might that tornado be? So if you are out mobile spotting, you know kind of where to focus your attention. Um, and if you are out an event or something like that, you know what part of the storm is in the tornado threat, what part of the storm is in maybe the hail and wind threat. So really helps you kind of focus in and determine what part of the storm might be doing what. We can also use it to sample straight line winds. Again, it's only going to work if it's moving in a direction towards the radar, uh, but it can be a useful tool if it does happen to be moving in that direction. So you can see an example of that here. This is an example of straight line winds moving actually towards the radar. So it's somewhere that velocity would be pretty useful. Um, but there's a lot that you can get out of this. So if you are in Pleasant Hill or a different location that's outside of the precipitation initially, you can see it moving towards your location. You can get an idea of how fast it might be moving and what direction it's moving in. So again, we're not expecting you guys to determine what speed you think those winds might be moving. But if you are in a location where you're worried about winds, you can see where they might be located and if they're heading towards you. This is what supercells look like on radar. You can see two initially, and then one starts to deviate off to the northeast, uh, but it kind of gives you an idea of what they might look like on radar, how they might move, and you don't see this conglomeration of storms all moving in one direction. Um, you can't actually get that deviant storm motion but if you do have a healthy supercell, it should be pretty steady state, should be moving in one direction. Um, so looping that radar is really going to give you an idea of what is the shape of the storm, what type of storm might I be looking at, 
uh, what direction is it moving, is it deviating, does it look like it's dying. That's all information that you can tell just based on looking at radar. So this is a different supercell, but it still looks pretty similar. Now you've got your hook echo on the end, and then the rest of the precipitation is distributed downwind. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea, where would I want to be focusing, probably in that hook echo region. Um, and then if I'm in a different location, where's the hail and rain? Where should I be worried about those threats? And if you looped it, you would see that this is moving to the northeast. Uh, so if you were spotting it, how would I need to move to keep up with it? And again, what part should I be focusing on? Once you look at it in velocity, you can really see where you'd want to focus in on, especially if you're concerned about uh, tornado development. You can see that uh, really tight couplet there west of Lukiba, and then if you put on uh, this little indicator, you can see this is the location that you would be focused on uh, if you are concerned about tornadic development. And it really helps you if you flip back to reflectivity, just see, again, where in that storm am I concerned about if I'm concerned about tornado threat. Okay, so let's get into some of the feature recognition, and we'll start out with shelf clouds. This doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be severe weather, uh, but what it does tell you is that you're not looking at a supercell. So when you have a shelf cloud, not looking at a supercell, not looking at a tornado threat. What it is telling you is that the storm is outflow dominant, uh, you've probably got some winds with it, it's all pushing outward. The way that you're going to recognize this shelf cloud is that it'll be all pushing out in one direction. Um, it kind of looks like a shelf but you're not going to see rotation side to side. Uh, you may see some turbulent motion right underneath it, but again, that whole feature is going to be moving straight outward and you're not really going to see rotation with it. And that's how you pick that out as a shelf cloud. Here's another example. This one would be moving right to left, so mainly moving outward. Again, you're not going to see that rotation with it. And you do see a couple of different layers here, um, so that can be kind of confusing. Might look like striations, might look like a sign of rotation. But if you're watching it with time, both of those layers would be moving out and would be moving in the same direction, and that's how you pick that out as a shelf cloud in this example. In this video, you'll see the shelf cloud develop over these homes and start to move outward. You can see both of those layers, but they're both heading outward in one direction. And then as that shelf cloud moves over, if you look up, you can see some really turbulent motion underneath it. Um, that's really typical underneath a shelf cloud. We call it a whale's mouth, um, and it's not indicative of rotation. So even though it gets mistaken for it a lot, it's not the type of rotation you would look for if you're trying to identify um, a tornado or a funnel cloud, that kind of thing. It's more of this rolling, boiling kind of sky and not necessarily this cohesive rotation that you would look for. So this is where we can use you guys as well. If we know that you're out in the field and we're starting to get reports of rotation, uh, we can actually say, are you seeing this at your location? What do you think it is? And if you've seen it before, you can say, hey, I think that's the underside of the shelf cloud. We just saw it pass over. It's not rotating we're not worried about it. And then we can get that information back to us um, and it really helps us with our warning decision. And we can make sure that the reports that we're getting in are not legitimate uh, rotation. So this is another example of a shelf cloud moving outward. And you can see some low hanging stuff underneath it um, and that would be something that could get reported into our office as a funnel cloud or a tornado. Uh, but since it's all just kind of moving out in one direction, um, not rotating, you're not seeing that funnel shape or that cohesive rotation, that's just the underside of the shelf cloud um, and not something to be worried about. So again, you really just see that outward movement and no sense of rotation, definitely a shelf cloud in this example. Here you'll see the shelf cloud move quickly over. As it passes, right after it goes over, you can see that rain on the lens. Um, that's really typical as a shelf cloud goes over, you'll see that edge move past you, your winds will probably pick up, and then after that, the rain will follow. So pretty typical structure for when the shelf cloud moves over your location. So now we'll move on to supercells. This is an example of a supercell from the sky, so not something that you would ever actually see, but it helps us kind of show the whole structure of the storm. There you can see the tilted updraft, your anvil cloud, and then the overshooting top above it. Uh, you can tell that this storm is still healthy because of that hard kind of knuckled appearance to the updraft. Uh, if it was starting to die, you would see a smoother shape to that updraft and may not see those hard knuckles or those new little updrafts coming up on the backside. This is more of what you would see from the ground. It's an example of a supercell here. And you can really see throughout the mid-levels of it that kind of sense of rotation. If you did see it moving, you would see this whole thing just moving from left to right and really rotating. And that's how you're going to tell it apart from a shelf cloud because the bottom of it does actually look like some of those shelf cloud examples that we saw before. Um, but again, if you watched it over time, really going to see a movement from left to right and that whole storm is just going to look like it's kind of corkscrew rotating. 
Another thing to point out in this example is that lightning strike. Uh, the spotter is actually in a really good spot. Um, they are a good distance from it, maintaining that safe distance. But that lightning strike is really close to their location. Um, and this can happen. It's probably the biggest hazard to our really seasoned chasers and spotters. Uh, they know how to stay in a good location. They know how to stay away from the severe weather threats. Uh, but they can still see lightning up to probably 10 miles away from that storm. So if you are out spotting, try to stay in a vehicle, uh, keep the windows rolled up to keep that current on the outside of the vehicle if it does get struck. Um, and if you have to be outside, just try to stay low and only do that for a short period of time, just so you can protect yourself from that lightning hazard. Here's another example of a supercell. Again, you can see that layered appearance throughout uh, basically the entire center of that storm. And if you watched it with time, you would start to see that rotation from left to right. You can also see a little bit of a rain-free base, which is where you're going to start focusing your attention, especially if you're looking for the development of a wall cloud um, or possibly a tornado. Supercells can look really different just depending on how much precipitation they have with them. This is an example of a low precipitation supercell. So you can see there over on the left uh, the rain-free base of that storm. But as you look to the right where you'd expect to see some really heavy rain throughout the anvil, you don't see a whole lot. It actually makes the storm look kind of sick. Uh, perhaps it's weakening or starting to die, but it's actually just a type of supercell. Uh, and where you see some of those streaks, especially just to the right of that rain-free base, you could actually see some pretty large hail. So just a type of supercell doesn't necessarily mean that it's weakening or starting to fall apart, and still something that you would need to be concerned about uh, if you were needing to drive through it or if it was moving towards your location. Then on the other end of the spectrum is the high precipitation supercell. You can see again that sense of rotation throughout that whole storm. Uh, the whole thing would be moving from left to right. But what you're really not seeing is that rain-free base that you saw in some of the other examples. Uh, throughout that whole center of the storm, you're just seeing a lot of heavy rain, very little contrast, and if there was a tornado, probably not going to be able to see it or pick it out. But these can be pretty dangerous. You're probably going to see 80 to maybe even 90 mile an hour wind. You might see some pretty large hail with it. And again, if there is a tornado developing, probably not going to see it. So something to definitely keep your distance from and can be pretty difficult as a spotter. If you're not seeing anything, just maintain a really good distance from it and definitely don't drive into it. Here's an example of a more classic supercell. And now that it's in motion, you can really see that sense of rotation. It's really obvious throughout kind of the mid and upper levels of the storm where the base looks a little more steady state. Uh, but the whole thing itself is actually rotating and moving towards your location. So this is a really good example of if you watch something over time, how it would be rotating and how you would pick that out as a supercell. If you were looking for the development of a wall cloud or perhaps a tornado, you're going to want to focus down at that thunderstorm base. Um, and you can see kind of over on the right side next to where you see a little bit brighter sky. That part of the base is where you would see a wall cloud develop if there was going to be one. So watch that entire base, but especially right next to where that precipitation is falling, that's probably where you're going to see a wall cloud develop if you do see one. Here the supercell is moving towards your location, and you can really see that sense of rotation throughout the whole depth of the storm, and especially kind of above the base where you see that strong left to right motion. Underneath that base is where you would want to focus if you were looking for any wall cloud development. In this case, the storm remains pretty high base. You don't actually ever see a wall cloud develop with it, uh, but that's where you would have been focusing if you were concerned about that or if you were out spotting it. Here you will actually see some low level development. So right now, the whole storm is really rotating from left to right, but you can see that scud starting to lift into the base and eventually starts to develop into a pretty low wall cloud. Now the wall cloud is actually rotating itself. Uh, it's a little hard to pick out just because of that upward motion. But once you get to the end of the frame here, it's really developed very close to the ground. Definitely something that you would be concerned about as a spotter um, and definitely where you would want to focus your attention from now on just so that you could see if there's going to be any sort of funnel or tornado develop right underneath that wall cloud. Speaking of wall clouds, uh, we'll just show a couple of examples of them and talk about how you would pick them out. Uh, it's basically just going to be an extension below that main thunderstorm base, and it's going to be rotating. So it can look pretty different just based on how close you might be to it, the sun angle on it. Uh, but how you pick it out is just going to be below that thunderstorm base, and it will be rotating. So here's another example. looks pretty different, but again, underneath your thunderstorm base, you can see just based on its shape how it might be rotating. Um, so this is another example of a wall cloud and what it might look like. Here, now that we put the storm into motion, you can see in this time lapse the 
wall cloud starting to develop underneath that thunderstorm base. Um, you can see the base there, especially if you watch it on that right edge, you can really see the rotation. Um, and then underneath it, that extension, while it is kind of developing on and off, you can really see the persistence of it below that thunderstorm base. Um, you can see that kind of sense of rotation. So even though it's still kind of fluctuating a little bit, you can really see how it's persistent. It's underneath that thunderstorm base and it is rotating. So definitely a wall cloud in that example. And again, where you're gonna wanna focus all of your attention as a spotter, if you are looking for the development of a funnel cloud or perhaps a tornado, it's gonna be that wall cloud right underneath that thunderstorm base. Here you can really see the low level rotation starting to develop underneath the supercell base um, and developing into a pretty low wall cloud. This is something that we would definitely be concerned about and as a warning forecaster, something that we would probably want to warn on, even if we don't ever see a tornado develop with that storm, definitely its proximity to the ground and that strong rotation is something that we would want to go ahead and warn on. So something that you would definitely want to report in if you did see it, and again, where you would want to focus all of your attention. And here now you can see some of that rotation is translated down to the ground. It is a time lapse, so it's still moving faster than what you would see in reality. Uh, but you really see that sense of rotation. Now it's starting to kick up some of that dust. Um, definitely something to be concerned about, especially as you see those little filaments that look like they're perhaps moving a little faster um, and rotating themselves. So not a cohesive funnel or a tornado right now, but definitely some low level rotation that you would be concerned about. It's also really starting to decrease your visibility. You see a lot of that dust kicked up um, and that's something that could cause a lot of problems from a spotting perspective. So you're probably gonna wanna put a little more distance between you and that feature and continue to watch it, but maintain a little bit safer of a distance just in case something does develop underneath there, especially with that lowered visibility. Here we'll show a couple of different examples of funnel clouds. Uh, this one you can see kind of that clear slot cutting in. That's pretty common as a tornado develops. And then you can see that funnel shape underneath it. You don't see a condensation funnel all the way to the ground, uh, but I will note that the ground is blocked from you, so you're not able to really see if there's any debris associated with that feature. Same thing here, you don't really see a condensation funnel all the way to the surface, but your near surface view is really blocked by some of those buildings and perhaps a hill, um, so you can't tell if there's any debris at the surface. And in both of these cases, there actually was. These are both tornadoes that had damage associated with them. Um, and so even though it may not look like a full tornado, uh, there could be some something occurring underneath it that you may not be able to see. So it's important to just report what you see. Um, if you did see this, it would be rotating. Report it in, just say, I see what looks like a funnel cloud. I'm not able to see the surface. And we're going to go ahead and warn on it either way. Um, so it's good information to us, and we'll find out uh, if there was any damage associated with it at a later time. And here's another example where if you were just looking up, probably just going to see this funnel cloud shape. But if you look underneath it in both examples, and especially the one on the right, you can really see some dust starting to get kicked up with it. Uh, this was only a few minutes away from fully condensing down and producing a pretty strong tornado. So this could just be the early stages of a developing tornado and not necessarily just a funnel cloud. So definitely something to still be concerned about and definitely still something to report in. Once you get into the stronger tornadoes and especially a little bit later in their life cycle, you're really gonna see that full condensation to the surface. I mean, you can actually see some debris outside of where you see the condensation funnel. Um, so definitely something where you're gonna wanna put a little more distance between you and that feature. You are at a good angle. You can see the bright sky behind it um, and you're able to really pick out that feature. But just based on the width of that tornado and the debris that you see outside it, definitely gonna wanna back up a little bit and put more distance in between you and that feature. And here this tornado looks extremely wide. Now, it was about a mile wide, but it looks probably even a little wider than that. And that's just based on your cloud base. Um, so the angle that you're at, the base of the clouds, that can all make tornadoes look pretty different and can increase or decrease your ability to see them and pick them out. And in this case, we are southeast of the tornado looking northwest. So a lot of precipitation behind it uh, makes it a lot harder to spot. And if you were at a further distance, you may not even be able to pick it out. So maybe something where you could bump a little bit more to the east, try to put a little more contrast behind it um, so that you're able to maintain your visibility of that feature, but also your safety. Both of those tornadoes were actually EF4. Um, and fortunately, most tornadoes are not that strong. So this is an example. This is the Lee Summit tornado from last year. It was an EF1 uh, damaged uh, strip mall and a firework stand, and that was about it. Um, so again, fortunately, this is probably what's gonna be more common. 
and probably the type of tornado that you're going to see more often in this area. The next video that I show is just a couple of minutes long, um, and I want you to listen to the dialogue, especially during the second half. And it's a good example of a couple of different types of tornadoes. You'll see three throughout it, but it's also a really good example of situational awareness and why you're probably going to want more than one person with you when you're out spotting. Gotta be real careful. Let's think about this. This is a very highly unstable tornado. Yeah. Huge cape. Let's 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 uh, pack up real quick. that tornado that you saw at the end of the frame was actually the one that we were talking about. And the person that was filming was just fixated on that main tornado and not seeing the one that was developing about a half mile away in the field next to us and headed towards our location. Um, so a good example of why you would really want more than one person with you, especially if you're reporting in or you're really fixated on it. Uh, perhaps you're responding to a call and everybody's busy doing their jobs. You need to have somebody else out looking and making sure that severe weather is not going to impact you at your location. It's pretty uncommon to have two well-developed tornadoes at the same time, uh, but it does happen where when one tornado is starting to dissipate, perhaps you see another one developing behind it. Um, so definitely something to watch out for and definitely a reason to maintain your situational awareness and always have someone looking around. Nighttime tornadoes are their own problem. The only way that you're really going to see them is if they're backlit by lightning. Um, so in this case, you're definitely going to want to put more space between you and the feature that you're looking at. Uh, if you do lose visual contact with it for a couple of minutes, you don't want it to be right next to you the next time you see it. So um, it's also a case where radar is a good idea. Uh, you can use that as a tool to help you figure out where that storm might be relative to your location, even if you're not able to see it. Um, but if you can't see it and your safety is at risk, definitely just back away. Uh, you guys are far more important than any report that you can give to us. Uh, so definitely just stay safe and keep a good distance from anything, especially at night. There are a lot of tornado lookalikes that can cause some issues uh, for us as morning forecasters and as well for you guys. And the first one is scud. Uh, it's not going to be rotating and that's how you really pick it out as not a more threatening feature. Its motion is going to be more upward and outward than rotational, um, but its location can be almost anywhere. You might see it underneath a wall cloud, you might see it looking like it's touching the ground, um, or it can be underneath stratus under something that's not even a storm. So 
You can see this almost anywhere, but especially when it's underneath a thunderstorm or underneath a wall cloud, that's when it starts getting mistaken for something a little more hazardous. SCUD is not going to be associated with damage, um, but it could develop into a wall cloud. You saw a few examples of that before. Um, so definitely something to keep an eye on, just not something that's severe at that time. Just watch it for as long as you can. Uh, get a good sense of whether or not it's persistent, whether or not it's really moving, um, and whether or not it's rotating. And that's going to tell you what you might be looking at and whether or not it should be hazardous. So here's an example of some SCUD underneath a thunderstorm base. So kind of funnel shaped, kind of looks hazardous. But if you watch this with time, it would really be changing shape. It would be pushing outward and you wouldn't see that sense of rotation that you would look for if it was a funnel cloud. So definitely scud in this example. Here you've got something that's almost touching the ground, um, but it looks like the shape might be a little off. And especially if you watch this with time, it's not going to hold together. You're not going to see some really good rotation and it's really going to show some features, uh, some transient features that are going to tell you this is not something that you need to be worried about. So again, just watch it over time a little bit and see if it's changing. Here again, you're underneath a thunderstorm base. Looks a little bit interesting, kind of funnel shaped. You can see that it's really raggedy and so it would be something that you would want to watch just for a couple of minutes and see if it's changing shape. It should be, um, otherwise it may be developing into something more hazardous. But at this time, definitely just looks like scud. Here in this video, you'll see on the right side of the screen moving towards you, uh, some scud. Looks like a little bit of rotation, especially in this time lapse, uh, but not that cohesive rotation you would look for with a funnel. Um, again, pretty raggedy, mainly moving outward, so not something that you need to be concerned about at that time. And here you can see some scud lifting up over an outflow boundary. Doesn't look very hazardous in the in the loop that you're seeing, but if you did look at a static frame, especially where it's starting to touch the ground, that could be something that people would be really concerned about. Um, so again, now that you're watching it over time, you're able to get an idea of how it's really changing in character, how it's moving outward, and how it's not rotating. Again, that's really going to help you identify that as scud, and that something is more hazardous. This is a really tough one. Gust nados can get mistaken for tornadoes a lot, um, and that's because they do rotate. However, that rotation should be broad um, and it should be slower than what you would see with a tornado. The motion is going to be more outward than rotational, so that's another way that you can help pick it out. Uh, but both of those still can be pretty confusing. So the main giveaway is going to be its location. Gust nados are not going to be located under a wall cloud. They should be out at the edge of the storm, uh, right underneath like a shelf cloud that we showed before. Um, they're probably not going to cause any damage. If they do, it's going to be consistent with that wind speed of the storm itself. Um, so 80 miles an hour or less and usually much less. There was an example over in Topeka's area a couple of years ago where they had around 80 mile an hour winds and some farm equipment damage. Um, so definitely confusing in that case and can be just super confusing in the field. But if you do see one, be very specific about your location. Where are you located? Where are you looking? How far away do you think it is? And we can use that information back in the office to tell if you're looking at a gust nado or something like a tornado. So try not to speculate on what you're seeing, just report in what you do see, and be extremely specific about where you are and where you're looking, and that'll help us figure it out. So this is an example of that one we were just talking about in Topeka's area. It's moving over a recently plowed field, so it's picked up a lot of debris and makes it look pretty threatening. But if you look above the surface, you really don't see a connection to the cloud base, um, and it looks like maybe it's broadening aloft, doesn't look as threatening. Especially if you move forward in time, you can see that moving outward. Um, that dust that's getting kicked up doesn't look quite as funnel shaped, not connected to the cloud base. And again, if you do see that cloud base, you can see the position of that gust nato relative to the edge of the storm. And it's right out on that front edge. So all of those things put together would really tell you that you're looking at a gust nato and not a tornado in that case. This is a video of a different gust nato, but still shows you kind of that motion. Definitely more outward than rotational, even though it is rotating. It kind of looks like a dust double. It does start to pick up a little bit of debris, but probably some leaf litter, some soil, that type of thing. Um, some really light objects and not necessarily something that could cause some significant damage. So once you see that motion, that more outward motion, its location would be on the edge of the storm. That's really going to give away what you might be looking at. And again, if you're not sure, just go ahead and report in what you do see and tell us where you're located. As first responders, we know that storms aren't going to be the most dangerous thing that you encounter, uh, but we do want to give you all the information that we can uh, just to keep you safe during severe weather. So there are a couple of mobile spotting gotchas that we do want you to be aware of, 
and be prepared for. First is just internet GPS and cell outages. Just expect that they're going to happen. Um, cell signal and especially the internet component of your cell signal can go out pretty easily as you get into rural areas. Even if you have a separate GPS device or a puck, those do tend to go out, um, especially if there's a storm near your location that can also influence your GPS signal. So just prepare for those to go out and do have a backup. Visibility can also be an issue if the storm's kicking up some dust or if there's rain at your location. Uh, it can make driving hazardous as well as decrease your ability to see whatever hazard might be near you. Um, so definitely something to watch out for and maybe a time to reposition so that you can improve your visibility. Flash flooding is always an issue when you're out spotting, um, especially if storms are moving over a location that you're planning to head or your current location can really build up the water on those road surfaces. Uh, so just be cautious when you're driving and try not to cross roads that do have standing water on them. We talked about lightning, but again, just something that can be really hazardous, even if you think you're a good location away from that storm. Um, so definitely try to stay in the vehicle as much as you can and stay low if you do have to be outside. And cyclic tornado genesis, like we showed in that video, there could be another tornado developing near your location, even if you're fixated on a different thing. Um, so definitely something to watch out for there. Make sure that you have a way of staying in contact, even if you're planning to contact through radio. Once you get a storm in between you and whatever you're trying to radio to, it can really reduce your radio range. So make sure that you do have a way to stay in contact and a backup to whatever that method might be. And just maintain your situational awareness at all times. Keep your head on a swivel and be aware of changing conditions around you. In these examples, the picture and the radar image next to it were both taken at the same time. And you can see the position of the person that was taking the photo to kind of give you an idea of the vantage point that you might want to have if you're out mobile spotting. So in this case, you're east of the storm looking west. Now you do have that sunlit background behind it that really helps you get a good contrast on the feature that you're looking at. Um, and you're also east of that storm that is moving east-northeast. So you're staying ahead of it. Uh, you've got some escape route options. If it was moving faster than you expected, you could get south and just get away from it. If you're trying to keep up with the storm, you would be able to head eastward. Um, looks like some options there. So a good location for both vantage and for staying safe and getting away from that storm if you need to. Same thing here east of the storm looking west. Looks like you're looking through a little more precipitation. You can see that both in the photo and the radar image. But again, that storm should be moving northeast. You've got a good east option with the interstate there and probably some other road options as well. Um, so a good vantage point for you to see the tornado, uh, for you to be able to continue spotting it, and for you to be able to get away if you would need to. And here you're a little bit further away from the storm. Uh, that storm is actually moving north with time. Uh, but again, you're in a really good position east of that storm looking west. You've got some good contrast and you're a safe distance away where you can still observe what's going on, uh, but have some options to get away from that storm. And just wrapping up some of the safety things, watch the storm motion like we talked about, loop that radar, get an idea of where the storm might be moving, where it's headed, um, and how close to you it might be. Just plan out your escape routes at all times, have an idea of what direction you might head if things start to go wrong. Um, and I show this road atlas over here. I know a lot of you have a GPS device already in your vehicles, uh, but this can give you some additional information like the road surface type. Is it paved or is it not paved? Um, and if it's really updated, there may be some construction information as well. So if you're trying to use a road as an escape route and then you find out that maybe it's a one lane road with a flagger on it, um, then you won't use that as your escape route. So a lot of good information in there as well. And again, make sure you're looking at road conditions. Are there storms moving over it right now? And are there additional storms forming that could move over it um, that could make that road surface a little bit more hazardous? Definitely use your visual and radar clues. Uh, we want you to be able to do mainly visual, which is why we spend a lot of time on feature recognition. But using radar as well, especially if you're behind a storm or it's starting to get dark out or you really can't see what you're focusing on, just kind of putting both of those together will really help you get a full picture of what you're looking at and can help you stay safe while you're out spotting. So here are just a few examples. This is a supercell. It would be rotating from left to right if you were looking at it in motion. Um, and right now, probably something that you wouldn't be immediately concerned about. Um, it is a supercell, so it probably still has some severe weather expected with it. So it probably still has some severe weather associated with it, uh, but that base is fairly high up. You don't see the development of a wall cloud and nothing imminent at this time. So definitely something to watch, but nothing imminent right now. Here you've got another supercell. Again, the whole thing would be rotating from left to right. 
but in this case you do see a well-developed wall cloud there on the right, um, getting pretty close to the ground, probably rotating pretty strongly. So in this case, definitely something that you would want to keep an eye on, probably something that you would be concerned about in the short term. Here you can see that layering in the middle of the supercell gives you a sense of that rotation from left to right. Your storm base goes across the entire screen, and then your wall cloud is underneath it. So you're really going to want to focus right underneath that wall cloud. Nothing imminent right now, but again, something that you would be very concerned about in the short term. Uh, could see a funnel or a tornado develop at any time. Here you're a little more zoomed in, so the storm base actually takes up the entire screen from left to right, and the wall cloud is in the center of the screen. Uh, this was rotating pretty strongly. It's very close to the ground, so something that you're going to want to keep focusing on um, and that could be dangerous very imminently. So definitely something to focus in on and keep your eye on as a spotter. And the final example here kind of shows where contrast can be an issue. Uh, you do have your wall cloud in the center of the screen, really close to the ground, uh, but you're not seeing underneath it all that well. So might be a case where you could reposition a little bit. Perhaps that would give you the opportunity to put a little more distance in between you and that feature just in case it does develop something. Uh, but definitely something to be very concerned about and definitely something that you're going to want to maintain your distance from, especially if you can't find a way to improve the contrast in that case. Most field units are going to end up reporting through dispatch. Uh, we do also have an 800 number if you want to contact us directly, uh, but most first responders are going to be reporting through dispatch. Dispatch will then be able to relay those reports directly to us, either through the MERS network in the metro area or via phone in other areas, and we'll be able to get that report to us immediately. Uh, those radios do play out in our operations area, and so it's nothing that we have to go physically check, and we'll get it as soon as you report it. Severe weather reports really improve the quality of our warnings, and especially if we're able to say fire department or law enforcement confirms a tornado, people are going to take that a lot more seriously than if we say Doppler radar indicated tornado. Um, it helps them believe that that threat is credible, that it's real, that it's happening, um, and actually will spur them to take action. So just that information that spotters are able to provide will improve the quality of that warning and save lives by encouraging people to act. When it's a hail or a wind report, it still really improves the quality of the warning. Um, if I have a severe thunderstorm warning out for two inch hail, then I get a report that says there's three and a half inch hail. Not only am I gonna update that warning, which improves its quality, but it also adjusts my conceptual model. So I can say, hey, now I know this storm is capable of producing three and a half inch hail. I'm gonna adjust how I warn for the rest of the day. So it not only improves the quality of that one warning, it improves all of the warnings for the rest of the day. So your reports are absolutely priceless and we definitely couldn't do the job that we do uh, without your reports. There are a couple of severe weather resources that I'll talk about really quickly. We do have a mobile website and a widget. We do not have an app yet, uh, but that widget does behave like an app um, and has a lot of good forecast information on it. This will be a good way of getting forecast information directly from us. As far as social media, we have both a Twitter and a Facebook account. We do try to post all of our situational awareness information on there, whether it's a fire weather day, severe weather day, winter weather, uh, whatever we're expecting, we do try to put it on both of those outlets. And then during severe weather, we'll update a little bit more frequently on Twitter, just because it's a little bit faster paced of a platform. Um, and that is a place we will tweet out some warnings. It's not a good place to receive warnings, but if you are gonna go ahead and retweet them for your jurisdiction, uh, that's a good way of getting that warning where you can just do a quick retweet instead of having to create something yourself. For radar, I would recommend a third party. Uh, what you would need is something that displays your GPS location along with that reflectivity and velocity product. Um, and that's not anything that's available on our mobile website or our widget, uh, but there are some good third party vendors out there and definitely something that you can use while you're out in the field. For receiving warnings, WEA should be pre-installed on most phones. Uh, that's how you're gonna get tornado warnings and flash flood warnings. But if you are interested in other types of warnings like the severe thunderstorm warnings, or if you want to monitor another location besides just your GPS location, uh, if you have family in another town or you want to monitor your house while you're at work, um, there are other apps like the Red Cross app that you would be able to use for that. Um, so a lot of options there. This is what our mobile website and widget look like. You can see the mobile website on the left and then the widget on the right. I mean, the widget again is going to behave kind of like an app, uh, so it's something that you can add to your home screen, just tap it, um, and the page that you see on the right will pop up for your location. And so I'll just leave this up here that you can pause the presentation if you want to. This gives both our mobile website there at the top 
And then the instructions, if you want to add the widget to your phone, just go ahead and pause this presentation, um, navigate to that website, and set it up following the steps on the screen. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening.